Hello. I want you to imagine that you're laying on the ground under a tree, blood everywhere. You fell off a tree, broke your neck, and now you can't feel or move anything. You don't have pain or time. You're about to die. What are you thinking about? Most likely you're thinking about what you wanted to do before this moment. You had this great bucket list full of exciting adventures that you'll never get to experience. Now look back on your life. What thoughts come to your mind? Probably some happy times, but also likely many regrets come to mind as well. It's those regrets I want to talk about today. I was thinking about the Dunning-Kruger effect. This has also been called the sophomoric syndrome or fallacy or something like that. Basically it's this idea that you know everything and now you're impervious to learning or correction. This is extremely common with religious people and, well, sophomore college students. You've learned a little bit and now your mind has been broadened. Somehow you've decided that you've learned everything you will ever need to know. Yep, life's pretty good when you know everything, right? You got this. Any college professor or parent has observed this behavior in others, probably many times. They say to the young people, you'll understand when you're older. Just wait till you get out in the real world. That young dumb head full of mush eventually does indeed learn that the school of hard knocks cannot be reasoned with. They will fall hard and bleed until they eventually eat a large helping of humble pie. We've all been in this position at one point or another. Now, what does the Dunning-Kruger effect have to do with regret? How are these two things related? First, let me say what the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect is. Have you ever noticed that the more you know, the more you know that you don't know? Ever noticed that the smarter you get, the dumber you feel? There's so much more to learn out there. Someone with the Dunning-Kruger effect, however, will learn a little and feel like the smartest person in the world, and that everyone who disagrees with them is obviously wrong. If you feel you're smart, you're probably one of the dumber ones. If you feel you're ignorant, you're probably one of the smarter ones. Getting smarter isn't always a boost to our self-esteem, but it's always beneficial in other obvious ways. So that's the dichotomy. But here's the thing. To be confident in decision making, even if you know you don't know enough, you just gotta move forward. Hard decisions can often have negative consequences, and you will always regret those decisions to some degree. Well, I submit that ignorant decision making is a necessity in life. We must make certain decisions, even when we don't have all the information. For better or worse, till death do you part. You get married, and now maybe you don't like the situation. If only you could go back and change your mind. But your mind was full of assumptions at that time. We always make decisions based on the best information at the time. Now, when we fuck up, how do we deal with this? You thought the ladder was stable, but your kid fell through the ladder and is dead now. You blame yourself, but you couldn't have known. Why are you blaming yourself? There's a difference between someone who fucks up goes home and blows their brains out, and someone who says, damn, oh well, and then gets a good night's sleep to try again tomorrow. Sure, being the cause of someone's death requires a time of heavy mourning, but does one person's unfortunate demise call for the death of another? There's something different between these two people. That difference is humility. Humility is misunderstood, in my opinion. As it is commonly understood, a humble person has no sense of confidence. Imagine a humble person right now. What do you see? I can guess that you're thinking of someone who refuses compliments and shrugs off public gratitude. Perhaps a selfless person who sacrifices their hard labor for someone else's glory. I can imagine a humble person, and be aware, this is an extreme example. His name is Gregory. Gregory spends his free days volunteering at the homeless shelter. He works tirelessly for the benefit of others. Then when someone says, thanks, Gregory says, please don't mention it. I just want you to be happy, he says. He never expects payment for his work and is obnoxiously grateful when he does get paid. Sometimes he refuses payment. Gregory isn't someone I would call strong or powerful. 
Here's the major problem with our definition of humility. In society, at least as far as I understand, humility is always tied to how a person responds to the response of others to their actions. Be humble means don't be a braggart. It means be selfless and giving. Society expects humble people to act a certain way. In fact, the all-knowing Google machine defines humility as a modest or low view of one's own importance. I see it differently. According to society, humility is for weak people. To be described as humble is essentially describing you as lacking in self-importance. It's as if, to have a good sense of self-esteem, we must necessarily lack humility. What? What the fuck, man? Humility is a terrible characterization by this definition. How can you be strong and humble at the same time? Does, or rather, should, humility be tied to one's self-importance? I don't think so. I think we can all agree that humility is something we should all aspire to, right? So, essentially, we are accepting that we should all disregard our sense of self-importance. Does this even make grammatical sense? What the hell? I think we need to develop a new sense of what humility actually is. I could go on bashing this concept of humility we commonly accept, but I think you get the point. At the end of the day, humility is simultaneously considered a universally desirable virtue, which necessarily forces us to discount other virtues like strength, sense of self, fortitude, self-confidence, and others. Good, truly desirable virtues should never dilute the value of other truly desirable virtues. Every virtue should be independently valuable and act cumulatively to create a well-rounded powerhouse person. So how do I think humility should be considered? How can one freely and openly display humility properly? I mean, I can't even publicly state, I'm humble. I'll be seen as someone who is necessarily not humble if I say this. To be considered humble, you require the approval of others. What the hell is the point of striving to achieve humility if you can't even admit you've obtained the goal? I think we should view humility as the antithesis of the Dunning-Kruger effect. I guess you could say the Dunning-Kruger effect is narcissism, and humility is the opposite of this. In a single sentence, humility is defined by me as the ability and readiness for a person to learn and internalize new and beneficial behaviors and information. You are always open for correction, capable of reorienting your mind, and constantly have a hunger for growth and instruction. A humble person can accept compliments freely and deservedly, and then leave it at that. A humble person who achieves something doesn't become self-important, but immediately switches back to his baseline state of seeking out new learning experiences. So you see, a humble person, from this definition, will appear classically humble, but not for the same reasons we are all used to hearing. His lack of perceived self-importance will be incidental to his baseline goal of learning more. He never thinks he knows everything, and he never feels that he is better than everyone else because he thrives on growth. Being important isn't even a consideration. Kind of like how MGTOW consider relationships with women. It's not even a concern. The humble man's natural state is an open book, a blank check. His hunger for growth is insatiable. He wants to learn, grow, and correct false assumptions. You can see how this kind of humility can define a man to his core. A humble man is incredibly powerful. He speaks with knowledge and experience. He knows he is absolutely right, but only because, whenever he was wrong, he immediately accepted his false awareness, dropped those assumptions immediately, and gratefully accepted the correction. Now I realize this may be difficult to conceptualize, but, as I've said before, to know what something really is, it's always best to compare it to something it is not. So take the Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm sure you've run into someone with this before. It's the old fart down the street who you met a couple days ago to talk politics. All these damn Negroes need to get back on the plantation, I says. He says, you're repulsed by this statement. And all these kids today are just worthless. Back in my day, I did five days work in one afternoon. Ungrateful brats. Why, back in my day, I had to walk five miles to school uphill both ways. Sometimes all three. 
and I never done had no shoes. I had to wrap burlap sacks around my feet to stop them rocks from making my blisters bleed, dagnabbit. All these rich yokels with their liberal hair and liberal motor cars. Why, back in my day, this old guy just knows how everything is supposed to be and how everyone is supposed to act. If he had his way, everyone would be the same across the board. Feminists are certain there's a wage gap. White racists are certain all the blacks are taking their women and jobs. Black racists are certain white people have nothing better to do than restrict their employment opportunities and that cops have nothing better to do than target them because they're black. Religious creationists are certain that science has absolutely nothing better to do than convince people that God doesn't exist. And both political party members are certain the other party is trying to destroy their own country, killing all the taxpayers in the process, and poking a big old hole in the ozone layer. <sighs> anyway, all these various groups are certain of what they know, and are impossible to reason with. A sophomore in college learned how to manipulate an algebraic equation, and goddamn, he's a smart cookie now. So, someone looking at his math homework tells him he can't divide by zero, and now, Embarrassed, he says, fuck you, and storms off. The common thread among these various examples is an inability to be corrected, whatever the particular reason for their confidence is. Now, a humble person will either be correct on all the above points, or be eager to get correct. Once corrected, he is grateful for the new information and immediately internalizes the new information. He continues this process his entire life. Now. What does that person have to regret? Every fuck up he made, he was grateful for the opportunity to grow. He put his failures behind him, not to run away from them, but he saw them as valuable learning experiences, which he knows he'd never have gained without the failure. As I said earlier, we all make decisions out of necessity, not because we are certain we are correct, but time, resources, and ignorance often lead to failure. The consequences of our decisions affect our minds, as if we made the decision because we had all the information. We feel we are required to be right at all times. If we fuck up, our self-worth is stained for life. So we immediately feel we are justified in sacrificing ourselves for fucking up. It's as if failure is never an option. Well, if we aren't allowed to fail, we necessarily aren't allowed to learn either. It's through our mistakes that we learn, but only if we desire to learn as a result. If we demand perfection for ourselves, we will always be disappointed. Regret will rule our lives. Honestly, humility as described above and patience are the two ingredients to a good, strong, powerful man. I think we should disregard the standard definition of humility that is commonly accepted. Humility, as I've defined it, can be internalized as a true badge of honor, not a mandate for self-loathing. Think of a decision you regret. Maybe you got married in the past and she fucked your life up. Why did you decide to get married? You decided to do this because of the information you had at the time. Did you know the future? Did you have a correct understanding about the consequences of your action? Obviously not, but you made the decision, and now you're stuck with the consequences. Now it's up to you, as a humble man, to eagerly and decisively internalize the new information, and if possible, correct your situation. No, you, the humble man, aren't happy, but you don't wear your failures, your bad decision, as a scarlet letter. Your failure is not a permanent stain which scars you for life. Instead of saying failure is not an option, and punishing yourself when you fail, you give yourself permission to say, failure is the only way to obtain the necessary information in the first place. Now, in your shitty circumstances, you have an opportunity to continue to build your life with this valuable information. Life is not a resume building app. You don't win anything on your deathbed by having no regrets. In fact, those without any regrets likely have the Dunning-Kruger effect. But a humble man doesn't regret his fuck-ups. 
He sees the shit he went through as the only way to get new information obtained through experience. Another way to say this is perspective. Perspective is the only thing worth obtaining in life. Your wealth, health, freedom, life, all our valuable stuff can disappear overnight. But can your perspective ever disappear? How can anyone take your life's perspective away from you? Your perspective is knowledge obtained through experience, and it is priceless. It is only earned through action and focused observation. You must reflect introspectively on all your wins and losses and learn from every one. No, you don't get to spend your perspective. So how can it be worth anything? Well, your perspective is who you are. Investing in yourself through focused observation is always valuable to you. You become an incredibly powerful person, unswayed by false suggestion, and always ready to adjust your mind to a new reality previously unknown to you. You can't be manipulated by liars. You can always take a compliment or criticism, and you always consider these things valuable as learning tools, but never let them define you. After all, you're too busy focusing on the present situation to be defined by anyone's opinion, good or bad. A humble man lives a life of focused observation and introspection. He is of no use to identity politicians or industrious women. He's not a man to be trifled with, since he can't be manipulated. He can't be shamed, since he knows who he is. He knows better. There is ultimate strength in humility. Strength, satisfaction, and mental freedom are his lot in life. Now, back to your deathbed in the field, under the tree. Imagine, you look back on a life of humility, as I described above. What are you doing? Well, you aren't looking back at all. That's all in the past, and because you were carefully and actively observing your past life as you went, there is nothing to regret. You, laying motionless under the tree, are the culmination of a life lived well. You are staring up at the blue sky, observing the trees swaying in the wind, and you're curious to see what this death thing is really all about. Humility is about honest curiosity that can never be satisfied. First, you must return to zero to remember what mental freedom was like. Then, you can begin to live a humble life, a life lived well. This is how I view humility. We should all try to be humble every single day, since that is something actually worth pursuing. There's no perfect state of humility. But being aware of it in this way, at least, makes it possible to achieve. It is, ultimately, a state of mind we could all benefit by pursuing. Thanks for listening.